There's a light in the sky, a rising in the air. There's a feeling so strong. It's time to light the fire, like a bright shining light. Love, getting more out of life. Love, sharing time. Hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and joining me, as always, is the sensational Joe Stanley. Hello, Joe. Darcy, it's so awesome to be here, as always. Can you believe spring is almost here? It is my favourite time of the year. Just put some extra spring in your step, pardon the pun, and the blossom. I mean, it's flowering already. It's like we're coming out the other side, Darcy. I love it. New beginning. Very spring look, Joe. Joe, looking sensational, as always, considering... The year so far, it couldn't be more welcome, Joe. So today the show is all about the three R's, rejuvenation, renewal and relaxation, finding ways to give ourselves a bit of a break at the moment. And to help us banish stress, AFL power couple Paul and Tammy Roos have got some words of wisdom when it comes to just that. Plus, we meet a young Australian of the year, Rhiannon Tracy, whose story we, you will not believe, us. Rhiannon is a Liptember ambassador, which is an initiative that I know you're incredibly uh, supportive of, uh, Joe. and I'm looking forward to hearing her story a bit later on in the show. Right now, though, it's the often misunderstood topic of medicinal cannabis. There's a lot of conflicting opinions and debates surrounding its use here in Australia. Some people still see it as a dangerous drug, Joe. Yet there's a big difference between recreational cannabis and medicinal cannabis, which was made legal in Australia just four years ago. Many health experts rate it as an effective option in managing chronic pain, the side effects of chemotherapy and conditions like epilepsy and multiple sclerosis. Although it isn't the same as the illegal drug people use to get high, a big stigma still surrounds it. Well, how it's prescribed and distributed varies across each state and territory, but for the many people who are looking for an alternative to traditional medications, cannabis could hold the key. So endo affects me every day, and I think that's a big misconception, is that endo only affects women at that time of the month. Endo affects my eating, it affects my exercise, it affects my personal life, my career. Michaela Kirsten and her partner Brent Arcuri are both 21, but have each spent over a decade battling chronic and painful conditions. Michaela's endometriosis causes scarring on her uterus, and Brent suffers from Crohn's disease, a condition that inflames the digestive tract. Both conditions are incurable, and mainstream pain management methods aren't always effective. I was basically told birth control is your only option or opioids for pain relief. And I didn't want to go down that route as a 21-year-old, at, at that time an 18-year-old woman. So after my partner had tried medical cannabis, I decided to give it a go. So it was a long trial and error process, like anything. You know, I tried many different diets from different doctors. I tried many different medications from different doctors. Had a lot of varying effects. None of them worked too well. I started seeing more specialist doctors and they started prescribing me steroid-based treatments. But basically, steroid-based treatments caused me to spiral into what was probably like the worst period of my life. I was so anxiety-driven to the point where even just leaving my room would bring on these massive bouts of pain. And that obviously drove me into a really kind of deep mental uh, depression. So after those treatments kind of failed, I was kind of left with, I felt I was left with no option but to try and something that was kind of plant-based or something that was alternative and that's when I found medical cannabis. The RACGP has been really um, supportive of those changes and feel that this is a big win for patients with chronic pain and a number of other chronic conditions. Dr Bruce Willett is thrilled about the recent changes to state law in Queensland, where GPs can now prescribe cannabis-type products. However, he doesn't see their use as a one-stop shop for chronic pain. We do know that sufferers of chronic pain actually have changes within their brain where they recruit more of their brain to focus on the chronic pain, um, which is one of the reasons why um, medications alone don't work. And for those patients, it's really important that, that cannabis is not seen as a, as a single um, solution. Patients with chronic pain need a, a team-based approach. They need lots of different sorts of um, interventions like physical treatments and psychological treatments. And so it's, it shouldn't all be about the medication. It, the medications need to be part of a total treatment regime. Now with the legal door wide open, 
there's an opportunity for more research into a treatment that up until now is limited in scientific evidence. So one of the exciting things really about the, the ability to use um, cannabis um, type products in a, in a medicinal way is means that there can be a lot more research into that and, and I think we're all really looking forward to the research coming out so we can prescribe these things with a lot more confidence. Delicious. For Brent and Michaela, keeping their pain in check means a whole host of lifestyle changes like sticking to a plant-based diet and getting enough sleep. But cannabis products play a big role in managing their symptoms. Yeah, so CBD oil um, is what we refer to as kind of like a background medication. So what that means is we don't feel any immediate effects from it. So there's no sort of psychoactive effects. It doesn't affect you mentally at all. All it does is um, it will kind of treat the pain that is subjective to your own body. So for me, I have um, Crohn's disease, obviously, and I have that kind of chronic pain in my stomach and that inflammation. So I notice for me, if I take it regularly over a period of weeks or over a period of months, I can notice that general sense, sense of inflammation not being as bad. It helps my, I guess, my brain distract myself from the pain. It allows me to still function when I'm on my period. The pain is so unbearable, it feels like there's barbed wire wrapped around my uterus, someone's stomping on it, and that takes that away. That allows me to focus on something else. Not always, like sometimes I just, bed's calling me and that's that, but it's the only thing that allows me to get out of bed some days. I'm going to finish the website today. Brent and Michaela want to debunk the stoner stereotype often associated with cannabis products. Their newfound treatments have given them both a new quality of life. So last week I went to the doctor and I got some pretty good news for the first time ever in my life. I was actually told I was in remission with my Crohn's disease and, you know, I wasn't over the top with it because I was told, you know, it could come back at some point, but, you know, and I'm not sitting here saying it is entirely because I was using cannabis, but I know within myself, 100%, if I was not using cannabis, I would not be in remission right now. Because marijuana has been criminalised for so long, there hasn't been a lot of long-term research into its benefits, but health workers like Dr Willett would like to one day be able to prescribe medical cannabis with confidence. Yeah, very interesting that, uh, Joe. Still to come, we look at the best ways to manage asthma, but up next, wellness warriors Paul and Tammy Roos deliver a lesson in mindfulness back after this on The House of Wellness. Well, two of my favourite people are AFL legend Paul Roos and his amazing wife, Tammy. Of course, Paul, you know, as the former AFL player, superstar player he was, and premiership senior coach. He played for Fitzroy and the Sydney Swans during the 80s and 90s, and he coached the Sydney Swans and Melbourne in the early 2000s. And Tammy is a highly qualified PhD in the arts of mindfulness and psychology, also a best-selling author. Making us look bad, Joe, yeah, Paul really? and Tammy. Yeah. They are a very formidable couple indeed. Oh, they are incredible, Darcy. They run very successful leadership courses and have great insight into being mindful and using meditation to combat stress to get through life's challenges. We loved having Tammy on the show earlier this year and I know Paul is a great mate of yours, Darcy. Yeah, one of the great people you meet in football, Joe. You really changed the game in terms of the conversations around uh, you know, meditation and mindfulness and well-being of players and was just an incredible player in his own right. And we could all do some extra tips right now to help us get through some of these rough times. So here's Paul and Tammy Roos with lesson one in living your best life. Who would have thought when we began 2020 and we were setting our intentions at New Year's Eve that the year was gonna unfold as it has? For most of us, it has been a year of tremendous change and to be honest, the world is in a massive reset. But one thing I know that can really help us navigate this new normal that we are going through is sticking to some small daily habits that actually sustain you and lift you up. How do you feel better in yourself? One thing that I started to change that really helped me and I started to look forward to was, I used to get in the car and go and get my coffee. Now, I simply, 
walk out my front door and I walk to get my coffee. And doing that has created a pause in my day, but something that I look forward to. So it nurtures me. And really it's almost like I now have this new habit that I've ingrained in my daily schedule that lifts me up. And because I'm feeling better, then I know that others in my household are gonna feel that impact too, because I've done something that felt good. It's something I enjoy. And the more I nurtured that small step, the better I felt within myself. It set my day up and I looked forward to it. So what can you do to really set your day up? Look forward to nurturing yourself moving forward in this new normal that we do have. But I cannot emphasize enough that when we stick to small daily habits that do actually nurture us, make us feel better, the end result is those around us can feel our positivity too. And we start to impact others as much as we impact ourselves. It's an incredibly uncertain time at the moment. I mean, things are changing hourly, daily, weekly. We've all seen the AFL press conference when the coach says in a bland sort of way, control what you can control. What does that actually mean? I guess in AFL football, it's, it's such a big sport and there's so much noise around. My first exposure to that was in my first year of coaching in 2003, where the CEO of the AFL said we couldn't win. We were playing ugly footy. What did that look like inside the football club as opposed to outside the football club? Outside, there was a bit of noise, there was a bit of media about it, and obviously became a, a big story. But inside the club, what could we control? We could clearly control how well we were playing. So we knew we had to play better. That's what the coach is talking about. What do you need to get done in order to be successful? I guess the other thing in AFL football is injuries. Injuries play a significant part, but there's not much you can do about them. So as soon as a player goes out of the team, as much as you're worried about him and concerned about him and want him to get better, really, you can't worry too much about him once the weekend comes around. You have to work out, who am I going to place in that position? Is he capable of fulfilling those obligations? And once you make that decision, you get on with it. All right? What can you control in these uncertain times? In 2005, Paul Roos guided the Swans to their first premiership in 72 years. So he knows a thing or two about leadership, uh, Joe. And Tammy really is the force behind the man. They've got a lot of great advice in the area of mental health. So make sure you tune in to see what they have to say over the coming weeks, Joe. From a masterclass in mindfulness to a winning beauty hack, this time it's about how to get luscious locks in a click of your fingers. If you open my bathroom cupboard or take a look in my handbag, one product you'll always find is dry shampoo. The dry shampoo that I use is the Chloran Nettle Dry Shampoo. I love that this product comes in both a clear formula and also a tinted. Someone like me who has dark hair, the tinted is genius and it doesn't show any residue or anything in your hair when you spray it on. When you're on your third day and you haven't washed your hair, which happens a lot when we're busy and we're time poor, I would typically use the dry shampoo. The thing I love about this dry shampoo is the fact that it has nettle extract, which helps absorb the oil in your hair. So once I've sprayed that into my hair, I like to wait around two minutes and then I actually like to massage it into my hair and it gives you that volume and also just makes it feel clean. But there you have it in two minutes without any water involved, I've actually got fresh, clean hair. One thing also about dry shampoo that a lot of people don't know is it can be used as a styling tool. So if you grab a section of your hair, about two to three centimetres. Apply your curling tongue as so, even if you just do just a few sections near your hairline and near your face. After I finish that, I like to apply the dry shampoo to just extra volume and help texturise my hair. And then simply... You can see, provides a messy yet lived in wave and the dry shampoo works nicer than hairspray because hairspray makes it go quite stiff, whereas this provides texture and looks good in dirty hair. For me, the dry shampoo is really my hidden secret weapon. Welcome back. Here in Melbourne, we're a month into stage four restrictions. 
Most of us are working from home, our kids are being taught remotely and there's no social contact outside the home. So geo devices have become essential items. But unfortunately, this increased reliance on technology has also seen a rise in cyberbullying. Latest figures suggest that more than half of Aussie kids have experienced it, which is an incredibly high number. Yeah, a lot for the young generation to deal with, and it has to be one of the things we talk about more than anything else on the House of Wellness Show, because online bullying happens mostly behind closed doors. It's virtually impossible to police. And Beck and I are very conscious of this with the kids. You spend a lot of time trying to get them off their devices. Mm. We're lucky they're pretty active, our guys. But the fact that that is all taken into the house, it's a big part of their life. It's a really challenging topic. It's important to know the warning signs as well and how we can stamp it out. And I spoke to Australia's eSafety Commissioner, Julie Inman Grant, to find out exactly how we might go about it. So, Julie, how would you describe cyberbullying? So cyberbullying is any form of taunt, um, abuse or intimidation, and it could even be social exclusion that is perpetrated through a device, whether an app, a game or through a phone. Have you seen a spike in cyberbullying since the COVID-19 crisis? We certainly have. We've seen a 40% spike of all online abuse overall uh, that has come into our office since the lockdown in early March, about a 21% increase in youth-based cyberbullying. What's notable there is um, youth-based cyberbullying tends to be peer-to-peer, -peer, so the abuse is an extension of conflict that might be happening within the schoolyard or amongst peer groups. The average age is 14 and girls are bullied more than boys. And, and is it different for boys and, and girls? Do you see different uh, categories? Well, we see uh, girls using what we call relational bullying tactics um, a lot more often. So causing drama, saying mean things, spreading, spreading rumours. Um, and with, with boys, we tend to see the more um, violent or the sharper end of the, the spectrum with taunts like, I hope you go kill yourself. And a, a new sort of taunt that we're seeing coming into our office has a COVID-19 flavor where kids are telling other kids that they hope they catch coronavirus and die. It's just awful, isn't it, when you, when, when you think about it as plain language as you describe. I mean, it's, it, it would be almost too much for adults to cope with and yet kids who perhaps haven't got the, the consciousness to understand just how damaging those words are. Are kids themselves shocked when you actually sit down with them and explain how devastating that can be? Yeah, and I think that's the challenge. I, I guess the uh, analogy is what we, what we see with road rage. When you're behind the wheel and behind the windshield, you, you might act and do things um, that you wouldn't do if you were face-to-face -face with a person on the street. That same dissociation happens when a young person is behind a keyboard and they can't actually see the impact that their digital words have on that child. And let me tell you, it causes immense amount of an emotional distress. And what's really insidious about cyberbullying is that it's very visible to a young person's peers, but it's also often submerged to parents and teachers yeah. so they don't see it happening. And it's pervasive and invasive. We've got these little supercomputers called smartphones that we um, put in our pocket. And so the, the bullying doesn't leave them at the schoolyard. It's much more relentless when it follows them into their home. A lot of kids won't talk to their parents or a trusted adult when something goes wrong because they fear device denial and taking away a digital device is like taking away their left arm. So as parents, we need to be calm, non-judgmental, and tell them we'll walk them through anything that they experience, even if they're the perpetrator on the other end. I find really terrifying the pressure on young girls especially to make themselves camera ready. It's very concerning and what's really concerning is that our girls, our teenagers are growing up very quickly. I read the other day that psychologists are saying that 14 is the new 18 because yeah. we're seeing teenagers dressing and using makeup and, you know, using positions that are very adult yeah. and much more than we would expect for and that I age. I was, uh, you know, having a look at, um, you know, my kids' phones and they share each other's location. Now, it looks innocent, it's great, you know, we know where Joe is, but at the same time, you know, if one person's being isolated and the rest of the group are together, in real time, you can witness yourself being excluded. So 
lots and lots to deal with for uh, young boys and young girls. Yeah, it's really scary. There are calls for the video sharing app TikTok to be banned in Australia due to security concerns. But with more than one and a half million Aussies using it, and many of them safely, fans of the apps are pushing back. So watch this space. Big discussion, that, with TikTok in my yes. household. I can promise you that. <laughs> Up next, Heinzi tells us about how to use charcoal in the kitchen minus the burn. That's right here on The House of Wellness. Welcome back to the House of Wellness. Most of us go out of our way, Joe, to avoid charcoal meals when it comes to <laughs> cooking. I've uh, overdone it a couple of times myself. Uh, on the barbecue with a sausage, uh, everyone's nuked a meal probably too often. Yes. Have you got any major kitchen disasters, Joe? you can share with us? Uh, remember I was on your show on Triple M one morning and I forgot my eggs were boiling <laughs> and they exploded That's and right. there was a fire in my kitchen. I so. do remember that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. It looked like your pans had been nuked in your backyard. Pretty much, yeah. And did your yeah. dog actually go on it? Yeah, but, yeah oh, she did. Oh, mm. gosh. Oh, this is <laughs> not good memories. <laughs> well, activated charcoal, I'm not sure that was activated, uh, <laughs> is a fine black powder that's traditionally been used in emergency rooms to treat overdoses and poisoning. It's said to absorb toxins and it isn't the same as your burnt eggs, Joe, or a charred sausage on the barbecue. No, a growing number of health advocates swear by it, including our man... Luke Heinze Hines. Here he is to show us why cooking with charcoal doesn't have to mean a black day in the kitchen. Activated charcoal, it's a fine black powder that can be made from bone char, coconut shells, peat, olive pits or even sawdust. The charcoal is actually activated by processing it at really high temperatures. As I get cooking, it's probably pretty important that I note that activated charcoal is not the same as the charcoal briquettes that are used on your barbecue. Although they can contain the same base materials, charcoal briquettes have not been activated at high temperatures, plus they can contain other toxic chemicals that are very harmful to humans. Once you've got the coconut cream and egg wash, you want to get onto your activated charcoal crumb. Now goes the activated charcoal, which is going to give this a really amazing black colour. Give it a good pinch of salt and mix well to combine. The interesting thing about activated charcoal is that it actually traps toxins and chemicals in your gut, preventing them from being absorbed. That looks good. Because activated charcoal isn't absorbed by our bodies, it actually carries those toxins out of our system through our stools. Now, because it can bind to a number of different toxins and drugs, it's fantastic as an anti-poison treatment and for drug overdoses. You want to cook them for about four to five minutes each side until they're cooked through and crispy on the outside. So why not just have a normal chicken schnitzel? Well, that's because my activated charcoal chicken schnitzel is everything you love about a schnitty with the health benefits of detoxifying the gut and aiding digestion. Because activated charcoal is renowned for cleansing and detoxifying, you can't look past putting it into a smoothie. That is why I'm gonna whip up this mango and passion fruit activated charcoal smoothie, which really hits the spot when it comes to both flavor and health benefits. You're gonna need some mango cheeks. Now, I use frozen because it makes a much thicker smoothie. Along with that, you need some almond or coconut milk, of course, your activated charcoal, your passion fruit pulp, and some ice. What I love about activated charcoal is that it is a natural remedy for food poisoning. Plus, it's fantastic for stomach issues such as gas and bloating. Now, I gotta warn you, I don't want you to judge a book by its cover right now. It does look very different. What's interesting about activated charcoal is that it doesn't have a distinct flavor or smell, meaning you can add it to pretty much anything. So if you're telling me that this can detoxify your system, improve your gut health, and make your teeth whiter, sign me up for a couple of liters. Heinze serving up a double delight there. He'll be back a little later in the show with another dish chock full of natural goodness. Well, we're all about harnessing the power of plants and nature, particularly when it comes to our diet and fighting off stress. So, Das, if you had to name one stress that you find most difficult in life, what would it be? I would say, uh, you know, being a parent of four kids, <laughs> trying to do that reasonably well, Joe, has its moments. Yeah, there's um, a lot of pressure there. Not always successfully, no. but uh, yeah, that causes a bit of, bit of stress from time to time. Well, a survey by the Australian Psychological Society found that financial worries rank 
as the number one cause of stress. And that's a fair point. So mm. I, you know, I think all of us feel that at various stages, followed by issues with family and health concerns. Stress obviously impacts our mental wellbeing, but can also have a major physical effect on our bodies. The fallout from the pandemic means it's more important than ever to find ways to unwind and de-stress that don't involve reaching out for the wine or vegging out on the couch, just binge watching all weekend. There are some healthy alternatives out there. This is what stress looks like. Whether the cause is work, family or money, we all know the effects, including racing thoughts, anxiety, fatigue, or for some, something more sinister. So when you're stressed or when your body is exposed to stressors, you then go into response mode. In many ways, it's actually a good response because what's happening, your body is being primed, your body is getting ready to either fight the stressor or to run away from that stressor. The problem, of course, is when that stress is ongoing or becomes more chronic. That's leading to a lot of other health issues as a result. The important thing we need to do is to support the systems in the body. Naturopath Victor Tabala sees many patients battling the fallout from stress. And while it's impossible to avoid, there are ways to manage it. The idea is, is how do we actually cope with the amount of physical and emotional stressors that are around us? And fortunately for us, we do have many ways to be able to, I guess, support the body's ability to be able to cope with that. So, you know, I'm trying aromatherapy, I'm trying teas, I'm trying, you know, baths and meditation, yoga, everything I can really. I'm so natural and I just want something really, you know, that's good for the baby and that's good for me. Fashion model May knows all too well the negative impact of stress. 12 hour work days, a three hour commute plus her first pregnancy all contributed to a breakdown in her health. I've been recently diagnosed with stress related insomnia, which has been a shock to me because I'm never someone who has had trouble sleeping until recently. I think something that people with insomnia would understand is that you're tired all the time. Even when you can't sleep, you're lying there tired, but your body just won't turn off, it won't stop going. So the plant kingdom provides us with a plethora of many options. When it comes to dealing with stress, my favourite herb, of course, is the herb ashwagandha. Used for over 3,000 years, this humble little shrub grown in India is known as the king of the Ayurvedic herbs and as one of the select group of herbs that help the body's natural ability to deal with stress, it's not hard to see why. When you're exposed to stresses, an adaptogen can help you raise your resistance to the effects of those stressors. Being such a versatile herb, it can also combine extremely well with other similar supportive herbs. So let's take, for example, ashwagandha combined with lavender oil and combined with passion flower taken at night can certainly help individuals who are struggling to get to sleep. Another wonderful action of ashwagandha uh, when it comes to supporting stress is its action when it comes to cognitive function. So think about memory recall and even learning ability. And the fact is you can take it ongoingly for as long as you need to. I mean, when you think about it, the stressors that affect our daily lives, they're very hard to escape from. They're never gonna go away. Daily stresses will always be a part of our lives. But like May, who recognise the signs, take a deep breath and find the release that works for you. I think stress is one of those things that'll just keep eating away at you if you don't really get on top of it. And, you know, what better time than now? Welcome back. This week is the start of spring. It's been a tough winter, Joe. So for many of us, it can't come soon enough. Oh, you're so right, Das. But for Australia's 2.7 million asthma sufferers, the increase in pollen and allergens can trigger hay fever symptoms and asthma flare-ups. The key is knowing how to manage these triggers. And for this, we turn to our trusty doctors, past and present. 
Hi and welcome to Medicine Past, Present and Future. My name's Dr Nick and I'm the past. And my name's Dr Isabel and I'm the future. And together we're, we're the, the present. present. Now asthma is one of the commonest diseases suffered by about one in nine Australians and it has no cure. It seems to be becoming more and more common all the time. So, Dr Nick, is asthma a disease of the modern era? Uh, it's a great question, Dr Isabel. The word asthma actually comes from the Greek, meaning to puff or to blow. And it was first used by Hippocrates nearly two and a half thousand years ago. So, not exactly new. So, if we knew about it nearly two and a half thousand years ago, did they have any treatments back then that maybe we could try now? <laughs> well, they had treatments that they thought worked because they said back then, if you drank the blood of wild horses and then ate 21 millipedes soaked in honey, you'd cure your asthma. 21 millipedes? Imagine if you only found 20, then what would you do? <laughs> Can you imagine? One more millipede and my asthma would have been gone. <laughs> but Dr Isabel, are we any nearer to knowing what causes asthma? We don't know what causes it, but what we do know, Dr Nick, is what can make it worse, what can trigger it. And those are things like dust, pollen, exercise and colds and flus. Now, I noticed you didn't mention smoking, because <laughs> there was a time when doctors recommended smoking, saying that the smoke would help clear the lungs and move the phlegm. Any truth to that? <laughs> well, it's certainly not what we recommend these days. In fact, smoking is a major trigger for asthma as well. And even having someone in the house who smokes and brings that in in their clothes can exactly exacerbate an asthma attack. So what's the best treatment for asthma these days? Right, so these days we use puffers and inhalers to treat asthma. However, as doctors, what we often find is that people don't know how to use them correctly. So, Dr Nick, I think you might have something for us today. I'm very glad you asked that, Dr Isabel, because yes, these days, we reckon that the best way to use an asthma puffer is through what's called a spacer. Now, this is a large volume one for adults. There are smaller ones for kids. And it's really simple. You just shake up your puffer, pop it in the end, puff, and then breathe. And that's your treatment. So, Dr Isabel, if asthma makes your breathing so difficult, does that mean it's the sort of thing that people can't play sports or they can't be singers? Not at all. Actually, there are a lot of famous sports people and singers who've been diagnosed with asthma, just to name two of them, David Beckham and the singer Pink. And in fact, exercise is really important for asthmatics because it makes the lungs work and keeps them healthy. But you may need to go to your doctor and develop what's called an asthma management plan in order to know how to do this safely. And you also may need to use your puffer before your exercise. Exercise is good for you no matter how bad your asthma is. In fact, Dr Nick, it's pretty good for you even if you don't have asthma. OK, Dr Isabel, how about we go for that power walk then? On these shoes, Dr Nick. Oh, come on. All right. Well, it's incredible to think that not so long ago, doctors recommended smoking cigarettes to clear out mucus and help manage asthma, Joe. Can you believe it? It is so crazy to imagine that. Of course, these days we know that smoking makes asthma much worse. Even secondhand smoke can trigger an asthma attack. So with the change of season, maybe it's time to think about making some changes to your life as well, like giving the smokes away. It's not easy, but one of the best things you can do to keep yourself and those around you breathing better is to butt out for good. I've got to say, I absolutely love peanut butter, but today I wanted to pair peanuts with something a bit different. Quintessentially Queensland ingredient, the pineapple. Well, this is a combination that I cannot wait to see. And did you know yeah. that all peanuts that come from Australia, most of them actually come from Queensland. It's like all great things come from Queensland. <sighs> Didn't want to say it, but sort of agree. <laughs> all jokes aside though, Luke, peanuts have some really fantastic health benefits, don't they? Look, what I love about peanuts is that they're packed with vitamin E, vitamin B1, magnesium. They're a great source of healthy fat and protein too. And ubiquinol. You, ubiquinol, what? Ubiquinol, which is an active form of CoQ10 and one of the most powerful antioxidants that's naturally found in our bodies. Ubiquinol is associated with over 95% of our body's cellular 
energy production, which essentially helps our organs function at optimal levels. How smart are our bodies, for one, doing all of that without us having to do anything? Unfortunately, though, Luke, it's not all good news because as we get older, our bodies are obviously exposed to environment and daily stresses and our body's natural levels of ubiquinol actually decrease. But we can get it from food, right? We definitely can, but to get the 100 milligram daily dose of ubiquinol, we have to eat about 1.5 kilograms of peanuts. Okay, I'm nuts about nuts, but that's just nuts. Please tell me you've got some good news. I do have some good news. Fortunately, we can get ubiquinol in supplement form where the CoQ10 has already been activated, which means it's just so much easier for our bodies to absorb. And speaking of absorbing, check this out. I think it is time to absorb this delicious charred pineapple with peanut brittle. It's like you're serving Queensland up on a plate, Luke. <laughs> delicious. Thank you. Dig in. <laughs> the A to Z of vitamins is brought to you by Go Healthy. For superior supplement, for healthy energy and vitality, try New Zealand's number one premium supplement. Now available in Australia. Well, that was Heinz and Laura there with a tropical treat to help gear us up for spring. September doesn't just herald a new season, Joe. It's also a month where the spotlight is well and truly turned on women's mental health. That's right, Das. Each year, the month of September becomes lip Timber, where women are encouraged to pop on their favourite shade of lippy to raise funds and awareness for positive mental health. I've been a proud ambassador for a few years now and I've met some amazing people, including Rhiannon Tracy. Rhiannon defied the odds after suffering a devastating injury in Bali that had doctors telling her she'd never walk again. 2012, Rhiannon founded her own charity, The Next Step, to help people recover from spinal cord injuries and neurological disorders. That same year, she was honoured as the Young Australian of the Year. She is the embodiment of courage and determination, and I had the pleasure of catching up with Rhiannon to chat about strength, resilience and so much more. Rhiannon, tell us about the trip to Bali that changed your life. Absolutely. Well, I went to Bali with my mum and my best friend back in September of 2009. So we're coming up to 11 years this September. And it was just like any other magnificent holiday in Bali. We went there every year. And this year we were celebrating my best friend's birthday. So, of course, the world works in crazy ways. And it was the night we were celebrating her birthday that I dove into a resort swimming pool um, that was technically meant to be a deep swimming pool. But I hit the bottom head first, breaking, well, breaking my neck and my back and instantly becoming a quadriplegic two months before my 21st birthday. I was rushed straight to the Dempasar Hospital there in Indonesia. And while waiting for emergency surgery, my mum was actually told that there was no time to fly me to another country, that the fragments of the broken vertebrae were actually piercing into both sides of my spinal cord, so it needed to be emergency surgery. However, waiting for that emergency surgery in the trauma ward, Bali was hit with a 7.6 magnitude earthquake. So I was pretty much pushed to the bottom of the priority list and almost lost my life due to the poor hospital care multiple times. So two and a half weeks later, literally taking my last breaths, I was finally flown back home to Australia. And then once back in Australia, you had to receive further surgery? Yes, so I actually was put straight into isolation and put into an induced coma. My family was told that pretty much everything surgery-wise that had happened in Bali needed to be corrected and I now needed three surgeries to correct what they had attempted to fix. When you began your recovery then or your rehab, you must have had some very dark times. I think it was definitely an emotional roller coaster. I think at the end of the day, I'm human. So I definitely had my good and my bad days. And I was very lucky because I've always been very, very close with my mum. And in my mind, and this, this makes sense to some, but not to others, anything my mum would tell me would outweigh anything the medical professions would tell me. So if I was being told that, no, you wouldn't do this, but then my mum came in and I'd ask her, she would be like, of course, like, of course you wouldn't. It was, it was her words that I would hold on to. It was her that was giving me that hope. Was there an actual moment, though, when you had to face the reality that you would not walk again? In my mind, no, there really wasn't because I've always been somebody who I guess has created my own rules and 
I've grown up um, an only child. I'm very, very stubborn and I'm very determined and not walking again was never going to be an option for me. Tell us how you got involved with Lip Timber. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I think everything that I have experienced in the last 11 years and not just directly associated with my injury, I have gone through... Things that everybody goes through. I've experienced physical trauma and I've definitely experienced emotional trauma as well. Whenever something has happened with me or with, whenever I've experienced grief, I've really just kind of soldiered on and, and pushed through. Whereas my marriage breakdown really hit me hard and the emotional trauma behind that for me was so much harder to push through than having my injury actually. I started seeing a counsellor and I was diagnosed with PTSD, so you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. But just being able to have somebody hold space for me and listen to me and just tell me that the thoughts and the feelings and the emotions that I was experiencing were totally normal. That was something that I hadn't personally experienced because I'd never I'd never just blurted out those feelings and emotions. Like I said, I'd always push through them. And mental health as a whole for me just became so important. And, and it was something that I think I'd really disregarded for such a long time in my life that now it was pivotal for me to get on top of it if I was really going to be able to move forward with my life in any aspect. What message would you give, especially to women who may be finding themselves in a bit of a dark place right now? We don't always have to be the strength. We don't always have to be. I know, I know it's, in, it's in who we are as women to be the nurturers and the carers, but sometimes it's okay to have somebody do that for us. And I think overall my message is just to speak up. And I have to ask, what is your favourite shade of lipstick? My favourite colour is pink, so give me anything pink and I feel good about it. Pink just makes me vibe. It gives me high vibes. I'm a typical girl in that sense. The roll call of Lip Timber Ambassadors is almost as outstanding as the cause itself. Go through this Rosie Batty, Chrissy Swan, Olympian Lydia, Lydia Lassler, who's mm. one of my all-time favourites, and many more, including yours truly, Joe. amongst mm. that remarkable group of women getting behind what is a very important cause. Yeah, so to support women's mental health and to rock your own favourite shade of lippy for a great cause, just head to the Lip Timber website. You can sign on to take part or support a friend or family member. Yeah, great stuff, Joe. Well done again. That's our show for today. Log on to our website, houseofwellness.com.au, to find out more about the show. Tune into the House of Wellness radio show with Joe and GQ every Sunday. You can also hear more of Joe and Emma, her co host, Emma Murray, on the podcast, The Best of You. Tell me yes. what's coming up on that, please. Well, I tell you, if you're after inspirational women, we have Caroline Buchanan, who's world BMX champion, and we have Morgan Mitchell, Australian Olympian sprinter, both incredibly inspiring stories. So check it out, podcast1australia.com.au, to download Best of You in the House of Wellness. Look forward to that, Joe, as always. And thanks to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. Until next time, stay well, stay safe, and if you're in Victoria, stay home. Time for friends, feel